Everything okay back there? What's your perspective on okay? Uh-oh, is it not working? Will we go live or? Yeah, we're going to go live. We'll be on time. Just make sure we change the music, please. Yeah. They are doing so good. I miss them. They are um, working. Um. They, they have done this with me. He did that with his dad. He's done it his entire life. They've never had a Sunday. They've, it, it's, and then, you know, when, when he took over worship at TGP, he just never stopped. And they just haven't had, a, like they work. They work, the only day they have is Saturday. And then, but even then, they're getting ready for, they've got six animals. And they, they, they love rescuing. Oh, okay. And so they, they've just not had, and, and I, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, can you close the door, please? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicholas. And just help people come in and. You're going to close it, right? Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. We're going to start. Good morning. Good morning and happy Sunday to you. I am grateful that you have joined us this morning. It's great to have you. It is so good to have our church family here. I love them so much. I, I always will reflect on the fact that when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That is always our strength. It isn't just us gathering, but it's that he is with us in our gathering. Uh, you know, years ago, I wrote a book in 1987. I think it, I published it in 1987. And it was called Changed in His Presence. And the whole book is really about the presence of God. It's about worship. And I've never been one that is a singer or I don't play an instrument. I couldn't tell you anything about musical notes. I wish I could. It's always been a desire of my heart, always. Because I always tapped or tied the presence of God in worship with, with music. And, but I always, like, but how does God use a, commons, a common man's worship? Um, you know, you, you go to church and you, you see these amazing, and you hear these amazing singers and musicians, and, and it's always about, you know, like that focus of the music and the, and the singing. But if you don't have a voice and if you don't play an instrument, I always wondered, like, well, but how can I tap into that with God? How can I be like that? And... <clears throat> And I had an encounter with God that so it absolutely shook my life. Uh, it was probably a two and a half hour l vision with, with in a prayer meeting on a Monday morning in a prayer meeting um, with a with about two hundred people, and I, I I literally collapsed under the the presence of God and had a vision that lasted. I don't really know how long it lasted, but people were aware. I, I, several. I, 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 and, and here's the thing, after that encounter, I couldn't speak in English for two days. I literally spoke in my heavenly language for two days. I could not speak in English. Um, 
it overwhelmed me. And so from that encounter, I wrote this book called Changed in His Presence. And the whole focus of the book was, you're never changed in the presence of a man. You're only changed in the presence of God. And one moment, just one moment in his presence can change your life. And I took the story of the woman in John chapter 4. She was married to five men, living with the sixth, but then she encountered the seventh man, perfection. And when she encountered him, I love the fact that he didn't highlight what she, you know, what she, her sins or her failures or her, he, he, he taught her about worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. The chapter before that, he's talking to Nicodemus and he's telling him about the importance of being born again. But with the woman, so he's talking to a religious man and he's telling him about being born again. But with the woman, he's teaching her about worshiping, but she was a Samaritan. And, but that one encounter with him that began with a conversation not only changed her life, it changed her community, but it was being in his presence. It was experiencing the presence of God. And that has always been my passion. Like, I don't care if I'm here alone. I don't care if there's one or two of us or 20 of us or 50 of us or a thousand of us. If he is with us, that's all that matters. A threefold cord is not easily broken. It's never about the big numbers. It's about him being with us. And that's what I pray this morning for all of us, that he is with us. And so I, I'm going to ask you in kindness to be patient. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you just to be patient for a moment with me. I, um, I always encounter the Lord this way where you hear it probably in my voice a little bit, but there's a trembling. And that's because I've been sensing this shift as I got in my car this morning and was driving here. And I was praying, and I don't like this shift. I don't like it because I'm prepared to preach on something else. I've already sent out an email telling everybody, you know, I'm going to be ministering on this particular, and, and really this, the, the whole message this morning was in the corner of little and God, and it's the whole thing about generosity. But I, if I'm being honest, I started to feel it. Not If I'm being honest, I am being honest. I started to feel it yesterday night and I was like, ah, but Lord, I'm, you know, so even this morning I got up and I'm, you know, open up and I'm praying and I'm looking over everything and I still didn't have this peace, but I thought, okay, I'm just going to push through. This is what I prepared for. That's why, again, the gospels tell us study to show, Paul said, study to show yourself approved, not study and this is what you'll preach. And I've been sensing this, this trembling in my spirit that, that it, it, it's going to shift. And so I ask you for your patience because I need it and your understanding because I need it. Uh, my mind has already been very prepared in teaching out of Matthew, the story of the talents. My, my, everything is there. All my study is there. The context, the previous chapter, Matthew 24, Matthew 25. I mean, it's all here. So now I've got to stop everything and go put the brakes on. What is the Lord saying? What is the Lord saying? What is the Lord saying to the one who needs to hear? So I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, with me. And Something powerful happens when we come into agreement. Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together unless they be agreed? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He said, if they shall touch anything in my name, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. And so this morning, we just want to join our hearts. We want to join our faith. Lord, we want to come boldly before your throne of grace this morning. 
And I don't know why you're doing this, but I have to obey you. I have no choice. I would rather offend everyone than to offend you, to grieve your spirit. And so, Lord, I approach you in, really in fear and in trembling that I don't want to miss you. I don't want to miss what your spirit wants to do in me and through me. And I ask you, Father, that you would clear the way of anything in me that stands in the way of that mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Even though I've prepared a whole nother subject matter, what matters is what you have to say, not what I have to say. You are the great teacher of the church, not me. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. I ask you to be with us. I ask you to teach us. I ask you to give us a hunger. A hunger for you. A hunger to know that you will carry us through. A faith to know. Not think, but know. That you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You will never abandon us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the words I speak this morning will be spirit and life. That will have nothing to do with my emotion or my delivery or the way I communicate them. But Lord, there will be oil. They will be salt. They will be light. They will be life to anyone, anyone that hears them. Lord, we belong to you. Lord, we surrender our life to you. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We give you our, our dreams. We give you the visions. We give you everything. We give you our sins. We give you our, our sicknesses, our diseases, our mindsets. Lord, I want your word to come alive inside of us. Because your word, Hebrews says, it's alive and it's powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. It is the discerner of our thoughts and even the very intents of our hearts. We can never fool you. We can never con you. We can never lie to you. Oh, God. Father, would you just have your way in everything this morning in us? We surrender. We yield our hearts to you. We relinquish control. We release the pain. We release those who have hurt us. Lord, release us from those who we've hurt. Forgive us. Forgive us for our shame. Forgive us for our past. Forgive us for our mistakes and our failures. Forgive us for our doubts and our worrying. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us. 
for our inward judgments. Forgive us for the words we've spoken out of anger. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for everything and anything that does not represent you. Forgive us for the times that we failed you, for the times that we hurt your heart, for the times that we disappointed you, for the times that we grieved your Holy Spirit, quenched your Holy Spirit. Forgive us. I ask you to make us new. I ask you to make everything new. As crazy as that sounds, as far-fetched as it seems at times, but it is true because it is your word. You make all things new. So Lord, I ask you for your grace. I ask you for your grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. Grace upon your people. With shouts of grace, grace to the mountains, God. Grace, grace to every mountain that stands before us. Grace, grace, Lord, like Zerubbabel, we shout grace, grace to every mountain in Jesus' name. We know that what God has joined together, no man can separate. We know that all things work together for our good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We know that no weapon formed against us shall prosper in every tongue that rises up against us. In judgment we condemn. We know that they overcame him with the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their lives even unto death. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Would you make us instruments of your grace? Lord, make us instruments of reconciliation. Awaken our hearts to your grace and to your mercy. Awaken our lives, Lord. Awaken us to your purpose. What is man that you're mindful of him? Thank you for the way you care for us. Thank you for the way that you care for us. Lord, I ask you to touch your precious people today. Those that are in this room, those that are watching, those that are hungering, those that are blind, would you open their eyes to you? Lord, we intercede for those this morning who are in that place of decision, those who are suffering with depression, those who are suffering with anxiety, those that are suffering in fear. Father, across this world, our world, our nations are in turmoil. And when, while many want to pronounce judgment is coming, Lord, I pronounce that revelation and revival and, Lord, a heart's awakening to you is coming. That in that crisis, Lord, we will turn to you. People around this world will open their eyes, God. Their eyes will be opened. Their hearts will be opened, Lord. There'll be a cry in their heart of desperation for salvation. For deliverance, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. You will not return until everyone has heard the gospel. Everyone has heard the name of Jesus mentioned. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord for salvation around this globe. Amen. I pray, God, I pray for a revelation of your heart this morning. Forgive me in advance if I miss it. 
forgive me in advance if I just even one word, I speak one word out of turn. If I say one thing that is not on your heart, forgive me for my humanity. But I pray today that my spirit will speak. And my spirit will speak because my spirit is ordered by your spirit. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Please, Jesus. Please, Lord. Please, Jesus. Touch the hearts of your people today who need you so desperately. Would you just lift your hands to him, please, for a moment? Just begin to cry out to him in your own heart, with your own words. No matter what you have need of this morning, he's with you. He's with you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. You're with us. As you were with the saints of old, you're with us. I thank you, Lord. We will not be a statistic. Bless your people with your presence this morning. in this small room with a small group with nothing fancy and across this world wherever they gather to glorify you may your presence be poured out upon those gatherings May preachers, men and women alike, stand as oracles of God, speaking the words of God this morning, bringing hurt to an end, pain to an end, bringing words of healing, words layered in oil, the oil of gladness. Father, use us for your glory. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. I vow to give you the glory. I vow to give you the praise. I vow to honor you with my life. Have your way, Lord. And all of God's people said amen, amen. and amen. amen. <laughs> Uh, I love you guys. I, you know, it is the, there's so much power that comes. You may be seated. There's so much power that comes when you're praying, you know, when, you know, the words of Jesus again come alive where two or three are gathered. If two of you shall agree touching anything, it shall be done. I, I just appreciate, I, I'm just so very grateful. I'm grateful to the Lord, I, of course. I'm grateful to, for the, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit of God in my life, as, as I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit of God in your life. I am so thankful for you just to be joining us this morning and for those that, an amazing team that just makes this happen technically and with all the technology. And, but, you know, with all the technology, without you guys in here, it just isn't the same. It just isn't the same. And I just really appreciate that you got up this morning and um, you made your way in here. And I thank you. I really do. Thank you for praying. Thank you for sowing. Thank you for believing. Thank you for standing. I'll say it till the day I die. You take nothing with you. I've done enough of these home celebrations and sadly I've done a lot of funerals and you learn from each one they take nothing with them except what they've done for God's kingdom mm -hmm. 
Whenever you go through change, COVID-19 changed us. Changed the way we do life for how many years now? Remove all the political leanings and and I'm sure for all of us we've lost loved ones and friends and to this dreaded virus it changed us it changed us for all the frontline workers doctors nurses how do we thank you how do we thank you for what you've endured what your family has been through too many lost their lives to it i i i speak for me when you lose cousins and close friends i don't care what what got them to that point but whenever you go through loss or change fear hits and our our nation has been paralyzed by fear and now there's fear you know in the ukraine and there's fear around the world with what could potentially happen should russia invade the ukraine the precious people of ukraine i i have loved going there and ministering and ministering those people are so precious you you can't help but you can't i mean anything you watch and there's fear there's just and so this morning as i as i let me just go ahead and get into this and just allow the lord to just guide me in every way And the reason that I tread very carefully with this is because it brings me to a place of vulnerability. N not everybody will understand what you go through. Not everybody, they all want to hear about your vulnerability, but some will use your vulnerability against you. They'll use it to gossip and to, and to prove their side or to say, oh, I told you so, I told you, ooh, I knew this years ago. Okay, well, good for you. But they actually didn't. All of us go through cycles in life where we, we struggle with different things in different seasons of our life, but every time you go through something, it is God bringing you out of it to strengthen you. So a few, maybe a month or two ago, I started just doing the, these Monday morning messages. And I, um, I just come on, I just come on, you know, Facebook Live, and I just share in the moment because it's very, I want it to be very different than Sunday, but I'm not sure that it really is that different. But I want it to be, and it will sort of organically grow on its own. But my whole point in, being, in doing that is because I just want to bring encouragement on a Monday morning. Because for a lot of people, Monday morning is a dread. And I don't care that people aren't watching it in that moment, but it's, they all know it's there. Should they, if, should they, want to watch it or connect with it or, or hear the word or, or just be encouraged. The whole point of it is just for that encouragement. And so as I was praying, you know, about that the last couple of weeks, the Lord just began to stir my heart with Genesis chapter 15. And so I, I, I titled the whole thought process of, you know, how do you battle fear how do you battle doubt? How do you battle? How do you come through times or seasons of discouragement? And I think with all the change that's going on around us, all the change that's going on inside of us, you've lost a loved one. Um, 
we we change is a part of life, right? We know that it, it's a part of life. It's amazing on how 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 everything in God's creation changes effortlessly, except humanity, except mankind. We have a hard time with change. We struggle with making changes. And so I. And, and I think, you know, every one of us has seasons in our life where you go through that change and some changes are far bigger than others. If you've lost a loved one, no one understands. No one knows what you've been through. They can't understand it. They can be in your shoes, but they don't know how to tie your shoes. No one knows what you've been through. No one can fully understand or grasp unless they've been through the same thing. And it's amazing on how many people have so much advice for you, but then they've never been through what you've been through. They've never done what you've done, but then they want to tell you how to do it or they want to advise you that you should do it this way. And I'm grateful. I'm always open. I'm always listening, I'm, uh, even, even to things that I may totally disagree with. God, could there be something in what they're saying to me that I need to change? As hard as that change is. So we will go through seasons of change in our life because that's what life does. And the hard thing is to, when you're going through the seasons of change, is to try to create the new habits or the new patterns that don't relate to the past. And so I just began to ponder those, those very thoughts of how many people right now are going through major changes in their life. And how many people are trying to advise them on what to do inside that change, but they don't know what that person is actually going through. And I thank God for those people. Listen, I thank God for the counsel and the advice and the encouragement. There's, there's, there's a place for all of us to lean and to glean from others. Therapy, talking to a pastor, talking to you know somebody that, you, that is a mentor or a leader. There's, it's so important to have those voices speaking into your life. But they will never know what you're going through. So when you sit and you listen to somebody who's actually been through it, there's a vulnerability. There's a trust. There's a transparency. There's an honesty. There's a, and, and, and whatever concerns you have seem to dissipate because what they're telling you is what you've been feeling or what you've been experiencing and those are all great things to relate to but but we've got to come back to this word we've got to come back to this word we've got to come as great as counselors and therapists and you know Brene Browns and all these people and doctors I mean there's so many good voices out there and they're so rich in what they, their wisdom and all their studies and but we've got to come back to this in the midst of that. Because this is what changes your life. The word of God changes your life. This is the word that is alive and powerful and sharper than any two edges. So this is it right here. I'm amazed on how many people want to run to prophets. And I love prophets. I've got them in my life. They speak into my life. I adore them. I respect them. I everything them. But I choose them very carefully. And I make sure that what they have to say lines up with what he says, because if they, what they have to say doesn't line up with what he is saying, I have to dismiss it. After 38 years of doing this thing that I do on a Sunday morning, I'm going to tell you now, if what I say, what I share doesn't come from this, don't dismiss it immediately. It's just going to be my thought. It's going to be my revelation. It's going to be my subjective truth. It's not the objective truth. This is objective truth. Whenever you go through something, whenever you go through an emotional moment, you've got to surrender and submit those emotional moments. That's, that's your truth at the moment. It's just how I feel at the moment. It's just how you feel right now. 
But you've got to submit those feelings and those emotions, that subjective truth that seems like truth in the moment, to the objective truth, and that is God's Word. What is God saying? What does He say about your situation? What is He saying concerning your heart, your life, what nobody else will know, what nobody else will understand? That's why in those moments of vulnerability, it is so important it is so important that in those moments of vulnerability, in those moments when you don't know, you don't know what to say, you don't know who to talk to, get on your knees and begin to talk to God who knows everything about you, who is so concerned about every facet of your life. This, is, this, is, this was a part of the, the whole thing that I was going to teach on yesterday, or today, uh, yesterday, oh, whatever, <laughs> there you go. Um, and so I'm, I was, this the whole message that I had originally prepared for this morning had to do with in the corner of little or God and little or little and God. How important the little things are in our life. And, and what, when you look at the importance of the little things in your life, you begin to see God's faithfulness in the big things. I'm not talking money and I'm not preaching that message. But there was a part of the message that I felt the Lord, the Lord was stirring my heart. And that's when Jesus said that God literally has numbered the hairs. All right, so that word numbered is actually the Greek word for counted. God knows literally the numbers by number. He has counted and numbered the hairs on your head. Each, okay, so the importance of mathematics. Each number has an identity, Amen. right? One has an identity. Two has an identity. I want you to think about this for a moment. How intricate God your Father is that He actually knows and has numbered each hair on your head. Each hair has a specific number and identity to it. That's how much he cares about the small details of your life. Not one of us knows. Not one of us knows the number. Not one of us has counted. But your heavenly father knows the very numbers of hair that you have because he's concerned about every single one of them. And if he cares about the number of hairs on your head, how much more does he care about every detail of your life? Hallelujah. That's the father I have. The father I have knows everything, every intricate detail of my life to the smallest iota, to the, to the, to the number. If I have one hair on my head, he's concerned about that one. Amen. So when I, when, I, when I relate to my relationship with my father, when I go through a moment, a season, a painful experience, Rather than just get out and blab it, I want to get on my face and say, God, what is it? What is it about this? What is it that you're doing? What is it that you desire to do? Lord, why has this fear so gripped my heart? Lord, why am I in this moment of discouragement? Lord, why? Why am I struggling with doubt? Why am I struggling with worry? Why am I, why is my mind consumed about the mistakes of the past? Lord, what have I, Lord, where have I missed it? And I can, you can quickly get into that where it's, we, we turn it inward. All of us are going to have seasons of our life where we don't understand why. Why the change? What's this internal war about? What is it that you're doing on the inside of me? I don't know if I'm, relate if I'm relating to one person. I thank God for that one. All of us have encountered seasons of change in our life. All of us had, have moments, and maybe even right now, are struggling with fear and struggling with... But if, if, So if we don't understand from God's Word that is alive and powerful... Okay, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a disciplined mind. If God has not given us the spirit of fear, then why is it that we struggle with it so much? If we have walked with the Lord and we are mature in our walk with God, 
And then fear hits us and we are immediately crippled and paralyzed by that fear. But yet we've been walking with Jesus for 20 and 30 years. I want to know. I want to know how to deal with that fear. I want to know what does God's word say so that when that fear hits, I know immediately what to do and how to reply and how to respond. And so that's where my heart has been. That's where my heart has been. That's what the, if, if I'm carrying the weight of something, that's what I've been carrying the weight of. People are going through major life changes. People are, are in a position right now where they're not sure. They're just, it's, it's, it's not we're stuck, but we're, we're, between, we're between here and there. And when you're stuck between here and there, it is so easy to, to turn inward and to allow discouragement. So, so here's sort of the process to this whole thing. Because if we don't address the fear, fear becomes doubt. And if we don't deal with the doubt, then the doubt becomes discouragement. And if we don't deal with the discouragement, the discouragement becomes depression. And so that's sort of what I, if I can just for a few moments, address. We, 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 we are literally through the pandemic, uh, anxiety through the roof, depression through the roof, suicide through the roof, fear through the roof, worry, all of that. Everything has escalated to, to I mean, it's, again, just remember, even like when the whole thing started, the t toilet paper. Why toilet paper? People are, toilet paper, you can find toilet paper. What's toilet paper got to do with it? But people were fearful. So how do we handle? I want you just to listen to these statistics because anxiety, because all of us, all of us have battled anxiety, even if you recognize it or you don't. You have anxious moments and yet we know, right? Be anxious for nothing. <laughs> how many times have we heard the verse how many times have I preached that verse and I still battle anxious moments? But if I didn't have that verse, I wouldn't know what to do with my anxiety. That's why I just want to take a few moments and just show you something about a life that we all respect. He's one of the heroes of faith. He's but one. You could be in a major transition in your life. You could be in a major transition in your career. You can be in a major transition in business or in personal or in church matter. And all of us will experience these moments of fear in this transition, right? We're in this transition of life. I mean, how I look at things in my, in my because I'm, I'm 60 years old now, almost 61. What I see today in my 60s, I never saw in my 30s. How I wish this Sam could talk to that Sam. But it took the experience, it took the, the walking through. And I, I realized that everything I go through and everything that you go through is for somebody else, just not for you alone. So when you go through these times, rather than complaining and allowing that, you know, to sink into that depression, realize that God can literally be using what you're going through for you to be able to speak into somebody else's life. And not only does it bless you, but it, bless, it blesses them, but it blesses you in return. What are we going to do? Seriously, what are we going to do? with what we've been through. What are we going to do? How are we going to relate to people? Are we going to relate to people or are we just going to sit and sulk over what we're, what we're going through? This is why I believe it's so important because anxiety today literally affects, I want you to hear this, it affects over 40 million adults in the U.S. This just in the U.S. Over 42 billion people, billion. Dollars, this is, the, this is what is being paid just to handle this thing, a year. And yet we have God's word. 
And this is why I'm saying to you, if we don't learn to get real with ourselves, real with God, real with one another, we're just going to be putting on the face, putting on the mask, putting on the facade, and nobody knows what we're going through because we're afraid. But I want you to see something in Genesis chapter 15. So if we don't deal with anxiety, here's what's going to happen. Depression, listen, depression is the leading cause of disability. It literally, it, now this is, this, we're not talking about the U.S., we're talking worldwide. It is the leading cause of disability worldwide. It literally, okay, the average age for depression in the United States is when it hits is 33 years old. Fear, we all go through fear, and fear is going to have two responses. With all the scriptures we have concerning fear, when we go through times of fear, we're going to either fight or we're going to flight. We're going to flee. We're going to run. And there is a time to fight, and there is a time to and, and there's a time for flight. Anytime we are in a prolonged season or battle, like we seem that we just get through one battle and here comes the next, all of us are longing for rest. And if you don't take time to rest and abide, then you will be driven and you will drive yourself into the ground. The stress of your day, day after day after day, there's a reason that God rested. There's a reason that Jesus separated himself from the crowd and the needs of the people and his own disciples and went and spent time and he rested and he spent time with his heavenly father in prayer. This is such an important part of our physical strength and being. We need to rest. We need to find just places where we can just rest and be at peace or find that peace in our relationship with God. So in Genesis chapter 15, it says, th this is so very powerful, please just, I'm, I'm not going to preach it, I'm not going to teach it, I just want to more share it, it's just way too much, I have probably 15 pages of notes, I'm not interested in going through the 15 pages, but there's some profound truth in this, and it says, this is verse 1 of Genesis chapter 15, and it says, after this, this is so important. Please, if I could, after this, this is why it is so important that when we open this word and we read this word, these are just words, right? They're words to us. After this, after this, after what? There's a reason it says after this. Okay, so what was the this that this is after? Why would, why would it be so important for God to say after this? All right, let me just go. This is verses one through five or one through six. It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And he says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what, what can you give me since I remain, there, here's his fear, I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. He said, this man will not be your heir, but a son, listen to this, but a son coming from your body will be your heir. He, and so it said, and now watch this. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, you, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Okay. How do we battle discouragement? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to the after this. How do we battle fear? How do we battle discouragement? How do we battle doubt? We've all heard it said, it's stated and continues to be stated, that 
it is the most repeated phrase in scripture. I'm not sure that it's there 365 times. I believe it is. I've not counted it 365 times to be exact. But it is the most repeated phrase in scripture. And the, and the phrase is this, do not be afraid. Over 350 times, it says, do not be afraid. In some variation or another, do not fear, do not be afraid. God said it to Gideon in uh, Judges chapter 6 when he was calling him to lead Israel. God spoke it to Jeremiah when he called him to be a prophet of the nations in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 8. And then Jesus said to the woman at the resurrection, he said the same thing to the woman at the resurrection. Jesus told his disciples, he said, do not worry. Do you remember when he says, do not worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear. Then he says it in Philippians. It said again in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, be anxious for nothing. Do not be afraid. So it, it is never God's will. It is never God's will for you and I to live a fearful life. It is never God's will for you and I to be fearful. It started in the Garden of Eden. This is where fear first took place. It was when Adam and Eve, Adam says, I hid for the first time in creation, in mankind, in history, these words are ever spoken. So it started in the Garden of Eden when Adam committed sin, both he and Eve committed sin. And this new word now came into their vocabulary, a word that they've never ever spoken. And he says, I was afraid, so I hid. So ever since that day, for all these years, from Genesis 3 on, we've been battling fear. We've been hiding. We battle discouragement. We battle doubt. All because it goes back to that day. All right. So in speaking to God, Adam said, I was afraid, so I hid. And mankind has been struggling with fear ever since. So we struggle with fear about our past. We struggle with fear about our present moment. We struggle with fear concerning our tomorrow. We battle anxiety. We, there's anxiety disorder now. Now we have depression. People are battling suicidal thoughts. And it's just the cycle and the pattern continues. And the truth is, all of us, at some point, and maybe today, you've been battling fear. Fear about tomorrow. Fear about the future. Fear about your next, whatever this next season is in your life, or fear about this job or this career shift and this change. So, and then, so, so fear is a very, it's, it's, it's become too natural, but fear is, is natural to man. Even though God, God's will was, God's will is never for us to be afraid, never us to, to walk in fear, never, because we know 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. That's why anytime you are you're attacked by fear, remember 1 John 18. Perfect love casts out fear. So if I can find my, myself coming back to that perfect love that he has for me, I can now begin to deal with the fear that is trying to literally paralyze my heart and paralyze my soul. Fear isn't just common to the general person. It's not just, it's, fear isn't just general to people who are non-believers. All of us believers have battled and are battling fear. And I want to come back to this. If we don't touch, the, if we don't address the fear, fear will become doubt. Doubt will become discouragement. Discouragement will become depression. That's why we have to break the cycle. Break the pattern. Let me give you a perfect example. We all in the body of Christ respect Elijah. Right? We, you can look at the heroes of faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11, and you, every one of those heroes of faith battled fear, and Elijah is among them. Here's Elijah who literally in 1 Kings 18 has this amazing encounter with God with the prophets of Baal. 
and he literally sees fire come from heaven and consume the sacrifice. That same Elijah, in the very next chapter, is afraid for his life, and he's running for his life and literally wanting to die because of a, a, a woman threatened to take his life. A, a woman, Ahab and Jezebel. And Jezebel said, what you've done to these prophets, I'm doing to you. And the man who literally just encountered a fire from heaven is running for his life, wanting to die. It's real. Or how about the disciples of Jesus? Right after the right after the death and the resurrection, the disciples of Jesus, he's he's right after he's crucified, what do they do? They run in fear and they're hiding in a home, afraid that the Jews will come and get them next. This is the very reason that we see there's so many admonitions throughout God's word where we read scriptures, do not be afraid. And I figure, look, if they went through that, we're going to go through that. I'm going to go through that. So how do I handle it? And so here's why this is such a reality. Because all of us battle fear one way or another. You may be, you, you may be battling it right this moment, right this second. And this is probably why I'm addressing it. It's for you. But I'm telling you, it is not just for you. It's for me too. Because why is this so important? What are some of the consequences to living in fear? There's consequences. Fear often leads to depression. So if we can address fear, we will then be able to address the, dep- and maybe we can cut off the depression before it hits. Proverbs chapter 12, verse, 30, tw- verse 25 says, anxiety in the heart of man brings depression. This is Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Anxiety in the heart of man brings depression. Fear or anxiety often leads to sin. All right, because we saw Abraham lie about his wife because he was afraid that the Egyptians were going to kill him and take her, so he lied twice. Fear will also immobilize our spiritual life. I want you to hear that, please. Fear will immobilize your spiritual life. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, the fear, of a, uh, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, will be a trap. And once that snare and once that trap is triggered, it doesn't let go. That's why it is so important for you and I to know that listen, it literally says the fear of man will prove to be a snare, a trap. Because once you're trapped in the fear of man, it, it's going to take the power of God to break that, break that trap open so that you don't... And I, I go back to Psalms 124 when David said, like a bird set free from the snare of the fowler. There's a snare. Literally, fear is that snare. And God wants to set your life. He wants to set my life free like that bird, but set free from the snare. And David said, my soul is free. How beautiful that our literally our soul can be so free to free from the fear, free, free from the depression, free, free from the discouragement. Here's probably the, one of the most important reasons why we need to understand this and battle it in the right way. Sadly, so many believers are so afraid of what people think about them are so afraid of what people are going to say about them. And so we live in the fear of image or reputation. And I want to say this again. Fear will literally immobilize your spiritual life. Fear will literally paralyze you from moving forward in life. Fear will also make God's word completely unproductive in your life. I want to say that to you again. Fear will make God's word unfruitful and unproductive in your life. How do I know? Matthew 13, 22 said, 
The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word of God, making it unfruitful. Let me say that one more. These are the words of Jesus. Said, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and make it unfruitful. This is why you have to live by this word. You got to build your life on the word. So for many, I was going to say it, for many Christians, God's word is no longer alive in them because instead of walking by faith, they're walking in worrying, they're walking in fear, and therefore God's word is literally choked and literally produces no fruit in their life. And they can run to meeting after meeting after meeting and service after service and get one prophetic word after another prophetic word. And the word of God is still unproductive in their life because they don't turn to it. Because we don't, we don't read it, we don't absorb it, we don't apply it. And because of that, that's why we see the enemy working so hard to bring fear into our lives, into the lives of believers. And sadly, listen, if we're not careful, it will absolutely severely handicap us from doing God's will. Fear will literally, hand, it will disable you, it will handicap you from doing God's will for your life. That's why it's through fear. Fear that literally Satan rules the heart of men and women. It's through fear. So coming back to Abram, all right. Why was he afraid? Why was he afraid in Genesis 15? So in Genesis 15, so in, in Genesis 15, Abraham is attacked by fear. And, and so we know that he was afraid because God approached him and said, do not be afraid. So he says to him, after this, you will, uh, I'm not going to go into it now. Read Genesis chapter 14. And you will understand, I'll tell you what it was, but read it because it, it's very powerful to understand why God said to him after this in Genesis 15.1. So in Genesis 15.1, he says, do not, after this, he says, God says to him, do not be afraid. And so God is not like us, right? He doesn't waste words. He says to Abram, do not be afraid. And so we can be sure that the reason that God said, don't be afraid, Abram, is because Abraham was afraid. And he was afraid, and he was discouraged. And so again, what was Abraham afraid of? So when you read Genesis 14, what you see is this. He defeated a coalition of four kings. Four kings, and one of those kings was the, the, he was the, the king of Elam. And, and, and he, so he, this, this king of Elam was so powerful, he so loved oppressing the other kings, the other, the other remaining kings, and he literally oppressed them for, he, five kings total, he oppressed them for 12 years. And so Abram, with 318 trained men, Along with two additional allies, he defeats the four kings of the east through, it was, it was a night attack. They defeated these kings and they took all their spoil and they also took back Lot. So here's again, another major victory, like Elijah. And the next thing we see is Abram is afraid. What was he afraid of? So after this, his fear was probably triggered to the fact that now he is literally really upset these five kings and they're going to come after him and there's going to be some retaliation. And there's going to be some, there's going to be a, there's going to be a price to pay for what he just did. So Abram naturally is afraid. And so God comes and says, do not be afraid. And here's, here's, because he says to God, I don't have an heir. And, 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 and again, so now he's thinking, I'm going to die. So I don't have anybody to pass on my inheritance to, except somebody that's not my son. And God said, no, 
you're going to have a son and it's going to come out of your body. Because God had already made him that promise. And I want to say this to you. When God makes you a promise, he's going to make sure that promise comes to pass. It is your responsibility and it is my responsibility. We're going to either walk in faith or we're going to walk in fear. If we walk in fear, we may miss that promise. We may miss that blessing because we've allowed fear to literally captivate us, paralyze us. And now why are so many people who were once believers turning away from their walk with God? Because they've allowed fear, they've allowed the, the, you know, the, the, the thought of man, the, they've, uh, they've been reading stupid stuff, and now they've literally questioned their faith. Well, you know, God just never came through for me. You know, God just never did this. God said he would do this, and then he never did. All right, but what were you doing? Because if you, if you were living in fear, don't you dare point your finger at God and say, no, 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 because you know what? God honors faith. And God understands our fears, but he also understands that when he gives you a promise, it is up. That's why not all the promises are on there. Most of all the promises in God's word are conditioned. If you do this, I'll do this. All right, so let me wrap this up. Is this helping anybody? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. You can't. You can't give up. What you hear me? You can't give up. I don't care what has come against you. I don't care who's turned against you. I don't care if the whole world turns against you. If God is for you, who can be against you? And if God is the author, he's the finisher. You can lose everybody don't lose him. Amen. You can lose your house. You can lose your job. You can lose your salary. You can lose your career. You can lose your car. You can lose everything. But you didn't make it happen for you. He did it. And if he did it before, do it he'll do it again. Hallelujah. Don't you dare think you got here. You're only where you're at because of his grace. And if you have to start all over again, I serve a God who can raise the dead. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare give in to fear. Don't you dare allow the changes around you to rob you of your relationship with the living God. And if Abraham battled fear, if Elijah battled fear, what makes you think you won't go through it? But when you do, remember God's word. He had to take Abraham out of the tent and say, I want you to look up. Can you count those stars, Abram? Can you count them? What about the sand on the seashore? Can you count those grains of sand? I'm going to give you sons and daughters more than the stars that you can't count and more than the sands of grain you can't count. As far-fetched, as crazy as it sounds, and it sounded... It's still coming to pass today. Amen. Till today. And Abraham has been dead for a long time. But God's promise has never died. It continues to unfold every single time somebody gives their heart to Jesus. Another son, another daughter, another star, another grain of sand has been added. Because he credited it to him as righteousness. He credited his faith as righteousness. 
That's why I love 2 Corinthians 9, that what we give, if we do it with the right heart, the result of our giving is righteous. It's the fruit of righteousness. It isn't a dollar. It isn't $20. It isn't a hundred. It isn't even a penny. It is your obedience. And in your obedience with the penny or the hundred, God said, I will add it to you as a fruit of righteousness. We see it as a dollar. We say, ah, here's 20 bucks, God, like you're paying them off. Keep it in your pocket. You don't owe him $20. He doesn't want your money. He wants your obedience. Yes. So that it can be credited to you as righteous. Amen. When you go through this, there's so much here. I'm not, I, may tap, I may tap into it a little bit more tomorrow. But when I think about Abram, so 318 men with two alliances defeat for the four kings. So they defeated these kings, they took the spoils, they took, they took Lot back. And so Abraham is fearing the repercussions because these kings were dangerous and they wanted retribution. the effects of every battle in our life was going to leave scars. And what I love about God's word is that these great men all had scars. Mm -hmm. All these great women had scars. And you and I are no different. We have battle scars. Yes, <sighs> Go back to verse 1. So what can I learn? I'm going to wrap this up right here. What can I learn about battling fear, doubt, discouragement? What are the secrets to battling fear? One thing, and I'm just going to touch on this. To battle fear, to battle doubt, to battle discouragement, you must recognize the root of it. That's why Jesus always addressed the root of something. We put an ax to the root. Go back to Genesis 15.1. It says, after this, the word of God, or the word of the Lord, came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. Listen to this. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. How important. Why is God his shield? Should those kings come and attack, I will protect you. And, he says, your very great reward. Again, Abraham, probably afraid, terrified of their retribution. Four kings are going to come in, they're going to just, they're going to take him out. And now he's thinking about his future. Man, I feel the anointing on this. Like some of you, you're concerned about your future. This is where my life is. This is what I'm going through. Dang it, I, I don't know about my future right now. Because I've just been through a major life shift. I've been through a major life change. I don't know. I don't know what's up. I don't know how it's going to change. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And so this fear begins to cause confusion, which then causes doubt. And then we begin to get discouraged. And next thing we know, we're in a room, isolated, dark, because we are literally filled and we're gripped with depression. So he's considering the fact that, listen, great, it was a great victory. But these guys are going to come back. And they're going to come back pissed. They're going to come back angry. They're mad. And they're going to want retribution. And I'm looking at my life from here on out, God, and I'm going, listen, I get it. This is great. It was a great victory. But I have no one to leave a legacy with. There's my issue. That's the real issue. I don't have a child. 
And so God shows up and he speaks directly to the root. What caused Abraham's fear was that I don't have a son to leave this to. And so God speaks directly to that fear, to the root of that fear, and he declares to Abraham, I am your shield and I'm your reward. I want to say this to you. God is your shield and your reward. So when the word declares no weapon formed against you shall prosper, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen. Doesn't say it won't be formed. It will not prosper. They will form. They won't prosper. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. I'll say it again. If God is for you, I don't care how many kings are after you in, retri in retribution in retaliation. So God says, Abram, I am your shield, your very great reward. And so Abram didn't need to worry about protection. Abram didn't have to worry about provision because God is going to take care of him. And in the same way that God took care of Abram, who then became Abraham in the same way that God took care of him. I'm here to tell you the same God who took care of him is going to take care of you. Amen. Just don't cave in to the fear. Amen. So one of the ways that we battle fear, fear is being aware of its root. Let me, let me stop there. I'm, I'm done. I, I have much more, but I'm done. For right now, I'm done. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says, You will keep, listen, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because... He trusts in you. Say that one more time. This is Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace him or her whose mind is steadfast because he, she trusts in you. When Peter Just like Peter, when he walked on the water, when Jesus bid him to come, when he started, he started right. But then Peter started looking and he started noticing and all the things that he got distracted by, the wind and the waves, as soon as he got focused on the circumstances, he became afraid and he started to sink. And that's exactly what happens to us. As soon as you begin to look at the circumstances and you get your eyes off of Jesus, you're going to begin to sink. In the same way that difficulties and circumstances and situations and deadlines and all these things and all these pressures in life, as soon as we get our eyes off of Jesus, we find ourselves sinking. But you have to keep your eyes on him. That's why in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, you will, keep, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast, is stayed on you and trusts you. So may I encourage you. I want to go back to the first verse. After this, the word of the Lord, Genesis 15, 1, and the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision and said, do not be afraid. Abram, I am your shield and very great reward. 
So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I come into agreement with that word, your word, that does not return void. It isn't empty. It isn't fruitless. It's not in vain. The word that you speak accomplishes its purpose. You don't waste words. You don't waste time. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for every single person today who is battling fear. It's the yoke. That yoke of fear is broken. Amen. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. Lord, we've tried to do it on our own and we have failed miserably. It is the anointing. It is the anointing. It is the anointing. It is the anointing, God. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. Father, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us for the times that we've allowed our lives to be riddled with fear. Forgive us for when we've acted upon that fear. Forgive us, Lord, forgive us, forgive us. But I am so reminded of your care for us. I'm amazed at your love and concern for us. I thank you for your faithfulness to us when we've been so faithless. When we've been so unfaithful, you remain faithful. You did it for your sake, your name's sake, not even just for us, but for your name's sake. Yes. Forgive us. Today, Lord, we stand. We stand in the promise. We stand in the promises of your word. Father, I thank you that perfect love casts out fear. Amen. For those of us, Lord, that need that perfect love, I ask you, Lord, that you would pour out your perfect love upon us. Amen. Lord, that there will be nothing that we should ever be afraid of because that perfect love casts out that fear. And I thank you, Lord, that you've not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a disciplined mind. Lord, help us to renew our minds according to your word, not according to the circumstances around us. And I thank you, Lord, that even as you were faithful to Elijah to deliver him, and you were faithful to Abram to deliver him, and you were faithful to Noah and to Moses and to Joshua, and Lord, I thank you, Lord, I thank you, God, in the way that you were faithful to all of your, the saints of old to deliver them, God, you are delivering us. For you never change. You never change. Your promises to them are your promises to us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that today we surrender all our fears to you. We give you our, we give you our past. We give you our present moment. And we surrender our lives to you concerning our future. I don't know why I feel this so strong in my spirit, but would you please just stand for a moment and just lift your hands to him. I want you just to lift your hands to him in faith. knowing that he who began this good work in you is faithful to complete it. Yes. 
You said you take our sins and you cast them, you throw them as far as the east is from the west. Micah declares that you take our sin and you bury it in the sea of forgetfulness to never remember it again. You said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Lord, forgive us for our fears. Forgive us for giving in to fear. And I ask you this morning, God, that you would put an ax to the very root of those fears. That, Father, that our life will be lived in faith, knowing that he who began a good work in us is faithful to complete it to the very end until the very day that Jesus returns. Father, I thank you that you are our shield and you are our reward. Lord, I declare it again. I thank you that you are our shield and you are our reward. I declare it again, Lord, that you are our shield and you are our very great reward. Father, I thank you that we won't have to live in the past or in the memories of it. I thank you, Lord God, that the future will continue to unfold before us. Amen. Lord, if you've been so faithful to us in the past, how will you not continue to be faithful to us in the present moment and in the future? So, Father, I thank you. I thank you that we will not look back, but we will look ahead, knowing to, for the even, Lord, even the greater days that are ahead of us. I thank you, Lord, that we will not be paralyzed or nor crippled by fear. We will not be paralyzed or crippled by doubt. We will not be paralyzed or crippled by discouragement, and we certainly will not be paralyzed and crippled by depression. Amen. So, Father, I thank you that we put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Amen. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you in Jesus' name that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, not loving our lives even unto death. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my life, I give you my present, I give you my future, I give you everything. I thank you for everything you have done. I thank you for everything you have done. And if you have brought us this far, if you've brought us this far, how will you not take us all the way in? I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Would you just put your loving arms around every single person right now, Lord, who can hear these words, God, who is battling fear, who's battling discouragement, who's battling those, those, that doubt, Father, who's battling that depression. Would you put your loving arms around them, and may you shower them with your love, I thank you, Lord, that perfect love, that perfect love, the love that says, I've literally numbered the hairs on your head and know each one of them individually. Thank you. Thank you for the way you love us. We trust you. I mean it, God. I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my heart. I trust you with my future. You are faithful. And you will remain faithful. Bless your people, Father. Bless your people. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. From the depths of my heart, I thank you. For those of you in this room, I thank you from the depths of my heart for your faithfulness. I love you guys so much. Thank you for coming Sunday after Sunday. Thank you for lighting up this room with the light of God's presence on your life, his countenance on your life. Thank you for the, the encouragement that you bring just merely by your presence being here. Thank you for joining online. I, I appreciate every one of you from the depths of my heart. I appreciate you so much. I do not take it lightly. Now the Lord bless you. And the Lord keep you. 
And the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I thank you for Numbers 26, uh, number 6, verses, 20, uh, verses 24 through 26, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. And I declare it, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding. The peace that guards your hearts and your minds. In Jesus' name, walk in that favor. Walk in that favor in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for sowing, for believing. I love you with all my heart. Have a wonderful week. I'm, I, I probably will continue some of this tomorrow morning at 11. I'll be here. You don't have to be, but just know that it's available to you on Facebook Live. Uh, it'll be there so you can watch it at any time after that. But um, I'm just very grateful, guys. I love you. Have a wonderful, have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Enjoy your day and enjoy your week. And remember... Greater is he that is in you than he that's in this world. And dang, it's hot in this room, isn't it? All right, bye, everybody. <laughs> oh, that's it. I receive that. I receive it. I love you guys.